I'm a weird bird. When I've studied kind of the greats and anything. Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Tom Brady. They all talk about having this obsessive quality or people thinking that they're crazy at one point or another. And when I think about a combo early, probably my teenage years, I started to think. I am the only combination of my parents in the whole world. Out of billions of people, I'm the only one. <laughs> And for some reason, as a kid, I was like, I have a responsibility with my name. Like, like they chose to be together. Like, what are the odds of them coming together? Out of all the millions of years on earth, they met, they came together. That's a miracle in itself. So as a teenager, I said, well, I'm a miracle because I'm a combination of them too. And for some reason, I was like, I'm not going to take that lightly. want to make them proud that I'm the combo of their DNA and they see their son go off and become everything he wanted to become and anything that he dreamed he went and achieved it so so that has been such a driver from my teenage years to now Tony dig Tony Tavares bowl of energy yes sir most enthusiastic, positive human being you can meet. Tony Tavares. Tony Tavares. We've Tony never Tavares. met somebody that has met Tony that doesn't love him. Woo! Boxes, boxes, I cannot fit in the boxes. See, he has this ability to pull the best out of people. It's just unmatched. Most people waver. It doesn't matter what's happening in his life. He stays up here all the time. Good morning. morning. Buenos dias. What is happening? Oh, you know, you know. Moving and shaking. It's a new book right here? Uh, yeah. yeah. Two wolves? Yeah, two wolves. What's cooking? Good. Calls were good this morning. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Florida's rolling. They're good. Brandon's got his first signing today. So, um, I got two interviews right now for Nate. I'll just start at 1030. Uh, two guys that are in roofing. Yeah. Um, so a lot going on tomorrow. I'm gonna head to Houston, and uh, then we got Dallas at the end of the week, and the next week Austin and Florida. Who is Tony? Who is Tony? I want to represent an idea that you truly can manifest anything you want in this world. I'm a kid that uh, grew up in a small country town in Grosbeck, Texas, where many of my, my teammates and many of my friends are still in that small 3A town doing the same thing. So to break away from that and achieve what I've been able to accomplish in my life and become an Olympian and, and be on you know, national television and now be a part of something so incredible at Linear, I get, I get called all the time or text all the time from you know, friends back in the day and they're like, man, it's so great to see you made it out. So I think who am I? I'm someone that's trying to blaze a path for other people to be able to, as well, gain some inspiration from to follow their own. Who's 18 year old Tony? 18 year old Tony was probably. Um, <laughs> very focused on himself. At that point, the dream was to go to the NFL and it was all about me, 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 you know? And I think that's where 
I probably lost myself in my early 20s. I, I went through some dark patches and I had to figure out, man, you needed to find some good mentors. I think Tony is a, is a product of two things. One, his parents, and two, Kurt. You gotta know, Kurt found Tony when he was very young. You know, not having my parents on me anymore, making me disciplined, and I think I had a, a gap there where I had to find myself and I had to find other mentors to follow that were doing great things in their life. And that's where, you know, I, I was able to luckily find a mentor like Kurt, you know, who I met at 21 years old, who was able to show me that, um, you know, with discipline and consistency and working together with others and actually lifting other people up around you you know that's the thing if you're if and you we hear the cliches like if you make a lot of other people's lives better your life will become better and i think over time i've started to realize it's not about me like take it take take it all off of me and make it about how do i make this person better kurt was his mentor for years and years and years and years and showed him the ebb and flows of life and business and, and and how to be successful, how to run a successful business, how to um, how to recruit, train, develop. Yeah, Tony is uh, light years uh, ahead of me in, in, in that he's 34 and, and he's got his head on his shoulders. Uh, in my opinion, his future is super bright, right? Um, he's also a pro athlete. He's, you know, he dominates every space of his life um, and he pours into other people so much he's selfless uh, when it comes to that so um, you know his his future is super super bright can you define happiness what's happening Tony they in trouble now <laughs> I toss and turn, I keep stressing my mind, mind I look for peace, but see I don't attain What I need for keeps this silly game we play Play Inner peace And self-awareness time was predominantly white town and I'm a new foreign kid coming in um, you know a minority an outsider so to speak of the school and um, coach embraced me I mean I don't I, I, I don't know what it was or how it formulated maybe it was he saw potential in me that maybe I couldn't see quite yet but I felt that father-son bond. And I, I remember thinking to myself in my teenage years that he didn't have a son. And I felt over time, by the time I got to my senior year, I felt like I was his adopted son. Something people have always asked me about is, uh, like what was the greatest game I ever played in or the greatest moments I ever had as a football player and, and as I reflect back and think um, there was only one game that, that can even compare or come close and uh, that was the China Springs game. Yeah, China Springs uh, was a great game for us. Yeah. Uh, Our game of the week and yes they are in different districts but it has kind of a district game feel to it. Whenever Gross back and China Spring meet up, both are on opposite sides of Waco, but both have a coach that shares a passion for football. China Springs is just throwing the ball all over the place. And that really wasn't our game. Our game was smash mouth. We, 
we take anybody on the track and run against us. But okay. them throwing throwing the ball against us. Uh, so that was before we were going into the match. You guys knew they were a throwing yes. team. Yes, they were okay. undefeated. They're, they were undefeated. They're undefeated, and they're putting 50, 60 points on oh, everybody no. they're playing. I didn't remember this piece. <laughs> they were let bad me, to the bone. Let me remind you. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, they they were not nice to anybody they played. Oh I shoot! So uh, I can remember. I can remember watching game film. Mm -hmm. And we're watching them just smoke all these people. Yeah. And I remember we we turned the projector off, and there's not a word. No coaches. Nobody is saying anything. I remember as kids, you know, we would play sports and uh, he would just, he would always, he always wanted to wake up early in the morning and go out and shoot a hundred baskets of basketball or whatever it was. He was always trying to get the edge. Describe to me in three words. Gave 110% in every, in everything he did. Everything. So he he was like the top student for in seventh grade that year in the classroom, and he was also the top student in athletics. Whatever he did, he was the top. And he was just an exceptional kid. When he first day that he came in, you knew it. You knew that Tony was exceptional. In the meantime, I guess it's Friday, game time. The Thursday before, I get a call. Your dad is not doing well. He's yeah. basically on his deathbed. Yeah. And so I go up there Friday. And Friday, I'm just... Uh, on game day. Oh, this is game day. This is game day. And so I am being pulled now. Okay. You know, where do where do my loyalties lie? Of course my loyalties lie with my dad. Yeah. But my loyalties also lie with a bunch of kids that are depending on me to be there right now. Yeah. Well my dad and I mean this guy every breath he's taking is struggling. Yeah. And he is fighting every breath that he takes. And uh, I don't, my dad, he would have been a great coach. He coached summer league and things like that. And he loved the profession that me and my brother were both in. Yeah. And I had no doubt where he, where he wanted me. He, he wanted me with my kids. And so, so I left and uh, went and coached that game. You might ask, well, how do you know all the details? Well. You know good and well that when something traumatic happens in your life, hmm. that you remember that. Hmm. You know, like, I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Yeah. But if something traumatic would have happened yesterday, yeah. my memory would have been a lot more in tune. And for this game, uh, my memory is uh, pretty sharp of everything that happened in this game. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it gets to be game time, and we're down. We go in at halftime, we're down 14 0. 14 0. Yeah, 14 0. Wow. And, uh, well, you might ask, well, what was the problem? Was, uh, to, were you yeah. calling wrong or yeah. whatever? Uh, we just weren't getting it done. Mm. Uh, we'd call the blitz, the blitz wasn't happening. We weren't getting the formations changed. It. Uh, I was struggling a little bit. You did. For that. You did early. Yeah. Uh, mm. And so we come in at halftime, and I guess, I guess I just lost it then because, mm. you know, we're behind. We have this game plan that we've been working on all week. It's not. It's there, but it's not getting done. Mm. The kids aren't executing. Yeah. And then my father's died. Yeah. And uh, so I, I let it all out, and I, I let everybody have it there at halftime and everything. And I was just trying to remind them. 
you know, of what it takes to fight. Yeah. You know, when you have people depending on you, can you fight? Can you do what you need to do to protect your family and uh, stand up and be the man that you're supposed to be? Do not cower to other people, even though they may have the advantage or whatever. Stand up for yourself and for others. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't, get, that wasn't getting done right there. Yeah. And so I'm torn with that and my dad. And so, like I said, I just let it all out at halftime. Now, I will tell you that y'all come back second half, shut them down. Mm. Oh, except for one call. You missed one call that <laughs> night. You missed one call. And I'll never forget because you were always trying to do this. Uh, it has to be a blitz. Yes. Off the yes. edge. I, I just wanted to blitz off that the was edge. It. And uh, that's what you called. <laughs> and I'm going, I threw, I remember I threw my card because I'm going, he's calling that blitz off the edge. For no and reason. It, I just course, wanted to go make a sack. Yes. And of course, uh, what did they do? They run right where you left. And so they scored on that one. But our offense came back and scored uh, four touchdowns. Yeah. And so and so we beat them. Really? China Springs? 3 0. Grossbeck 2 and 1. First quarter. Coogs going against the wind. Dustin Eskew. Picked by Ryan Fuel. He gets a little bit on the return. And then that'll set up the ghost shop on offense from there. And it's Cody Wilson with the middle screen to John Mark Hill. Right there, and watch the little guy go. 24 yards. That will set up a field goal try from Chris Faber. The attempt is blocked, though. Eric Kersey flashes in from the right side. This one remains scoreless for the time being. Goes back on offense in a second. Looking for a touchdown. Wilson hangs it up, and Mike Hicks there for the interception. Coons get the ball and the win this time. Dustin Askew goes up top to Mike Hicks. Great adjustment, great grab. You see me on the sideline get ripped by the referee there, but you see the end result too. He gets in the end zone, that's a touchdown, making seven nothing. Right now, this one in the fourth quarter. Grosbeck hanging on to a three-point lead. Barnberg by the referee there. What does Tony fear? Now, not being true to myself. And impeccable with my word to the core. Not living my life the way that I want to live it, living it the way that other people want me to live it. That's a, that's a fear. Don't be afraid of the dark. Be careful with stars. Not every life. Breaking developments that school shooting authorities racing to the scene in Arlington, Texas. Just seeing everything that's going on in the world right now. Oh, man, now that I have a daughter, seeing a school shooting and things, it just makes you think. Everything's about your environment. Like, and I take that so seriously as a parent now. You know, Ziva, our three-year-old daughter, she was unplanned. I didn't plan at that time of being a father. Uh, but when it happened, you know, me and my fiance both stepped up and said, you know what? We're gonna make a choice to have her and we're gonna be the best fucking parents on earth. Like we are gonna make sure her environment is amazing. Like we will not be the cause of any patterns to hurt her in her life. And the reason why it's so important is because my parents gave me such a great environment. And I can look at that now and say, I am who I am today. And I'm where I am today because of my environment. Being Tony's mom made it kind of easy to be a parent. You know, he wasn't a difficult child. Teacher pops out of, the, of her room. She sees him, you know. I look in, she comes out, and she goes to shake my hand. And she says, I want to sh shake the hand of the greatest father in the world. I'm like, where's this coming from? And she says, well, Tony says you're the 
best father ever. And so, you know, that it, it, I was lost in my embarrassment for a while. And, and yeah, I, did, I really didn't know what to say. Like, I'm like, <laughs> my son's always doing little crazy things like that. Not just at that age, but at different ages. So I was like, and I, and I was already used to it. So I was like, okay. Um, and then she says, but you know, there's one thing about him. She says, he tries to teach my class. So I turned to her and I said, welcome to my world. At home, he tries to be the parent. <laughs> Just like I see why your parents were the way they were with you. Like I picked up on some of that while I was with you and I was only there for some months. Yeah. But I feel like, and hey, I could be totally wrong because like I said, I'm not a parent. I've been a step parent at times, but I do not have any kids. So who am I? I'm not judging anyone. But if you were to ask me, one of the biggest problems in this world today is because people aren't parents anymore, they're friends. People want to be accepted by their kids or people are so young and having kids, it's like you're wanting to be friends with them and you want their friends to like you and this and that. And like respect and morals are all out the door. People don't have personal time with their kids anymore. Like when I see people that are actually interactive with their kids, I love it. Like literally, if we were to walk outside right now and I seen a, a, a gentleman playing catch with his son, I'm gonna stop him and say, excuse me, sir, I love what you're doing. Yeah. Might not mean much, but to me, it means a lot because you don't see that anymore. I would like to see him retire early and enjoy his kids. That's what I mean. Well, and that's, I see that. I see it for Tony because Tony knows how, how invested his parents were in him. His parents were in, invested. They went to, they didn't miss a game. They didn't miss a practice. They, or, well, maybe a practice. But, you know, there was, there was just things well, they Ted didn't Ted basically miss. ran they, all the practice. They set themselves up to, by the time that they in sports, which Steve is only, you know, three now. and. Uh, but by the time they were doing things, they set themselves up to be in a position where they could not miss anything. And Tony knows how valuable that was. And we have another special guest in the house. And, and I can probably say this, and this will probably hold true for a while, both literally and physically, we have the biggest guest <laughs> that we've ever had. Um, I'm going to give you a little background on this guy and tell you who he is and let him have at it. So he is a sales coach for over 12 years at the highest level in the fitness industry and now in the roofing industry. Did you ever see yourself involving yourself with bodybuilding? Mm. I loved lifting. I loved competing in the gym. And that's, you know, that was from football. That was from sports and athletics. Um, and after I left football in my early 20s, I didn't really think I would ever compete or be in the bodybuilding world. It was never something that crossed my mind. And, uh, you know, I had a great four year run. And, uh, you know, won the overall at Universe, which was amazing. One of the highest moments of my life to work towards something and put in that consistency and discipline and three years later, two and a half years later, become a pro where, where some people are working for eight, 10, 10 years plus or never get it. And I was able to do it so fast, but then when an overall and national show was amazing and then go on to have two, uh, had three top three finishes, win a pro show, go to the Arnold, which was just amazing. Going to the Olympia, just being with the, the elite world-class athletes um, is was awesome because you're now a part of an elite group, and 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 doing that, it made me reflect. You know, the Olympia was nine months ago, and many people thought, well, he has this company, he has all this other stuff going on, HGTV, a lot in my life, and some thought, you know, I'd go to the Olympia and I would hang it up, and and I thought about it. You know, I really thought about it. It was actually after reading The Alchemist that it shifted. Yeah, he's real jovial. You know, it's like he's this big giant guy and 
you know, you meet him and you might think, oh gosh, you know, he's just so, such a scary guy. He's the least scary guy in the world. He's like a big teddy bear, you know, at the end of the day. But when it comes down to it, when it comes down to doing his things, whatever that is, you know, I grew up with the guy, so I've seen his things change over the years, what he's doing. And it's not, he hasn't done one thing his whole life. And, and he is one of the most diverse uh, in terms of his interest that you'll see. But when it comes down to, I want to be good at something, I want to do something, um, then he goes for it. In my opinion, that's, that's, you know, like the warrior. That's what the warrior does. You want something, you go get it. When he stopped playing football, because he kept having an injury and he decided to uh, step out of football, which was a really big thing for him because to him back then, that was like football was his life. And he was about to be the starting linebacker um, at North Texas. And um, he had to tell the coach that he was gonna stop playing. Anyway, we said, well, once you're not playing football, you're gonna have a job. Because you have to like, you know, have a job. You're not gonna be playing. And he ended up, first he started working at the vitamin shop and then he got a job at uh, Johnny Carino's. Carino's, which I don't even know if they're around anymore. It was a restaurant. And they started him out as a busboy. And everything he does, he's enthused. He's like, daddy, he would always call it, daddy, I got a job at Johnny Carino's. I'm a busboy, but I'm trying to get them to make, let me work in the kitchen. And so then the next, like four days later, he's like, Daddy, guess what? They let me in the kitchen and I had these steel gloves on and they let me cut up the chicken. He was so excited about that. He's like, you should see me. I had the steel gloves and I'm cutting the chicken with on the machine. So then about uh, five days later, so he's like two weeks into his career at Johnny Carino's, and he's like, guess what, guys? They finally let me become a chef. <laughs> he's like, I have a hat. I got my stud. I am the cutest chef that they've ever had. So of course, after that, he's like, you guys have to come up here so I can cook for you. And he's like, and guess what? This is gonna be so good with the ladies. <laughs> Cause now I'm so cute and I know how to cook. I know how to make all these recipes. So he was super excited. So like two weeks into his career, he got promoted into cooking. And so he was so excited about that. Wow. But it's like that energy, like and that enthusiasm of whatever it is that he does, you know, he's like, this is it. This is like the best thing. The other thing that made me very proud of him was something that he did what he while he was in LA Fitness. And one day he calls me up, he calls me and his mother up, and he says, um, I have to read you this letter that I got. And he reads this letter, and it's a woman sent this letter to the president of you know the, the company, LA Fitness, and thanking them for having Tony there because of he was such an amazing young man. This lady had cancer, and she came in, she was overweight, and she told him her story. And she didn't have the money to start uh, a program, but he felt so bad and he wanted to help that he paid for her to start the program. And to me, that when he read that letter, that was just so touching to us that he was, he was out there, he wanted to help, that he saw an opportunity and, and, he, and he helped. And so recently, actually, I talked to him and I said, Tony, whatever happened to that girl that had cancer? Well, he goes, she's a survivor. And I call her my warrior when I talk to her. Every two years we talk. And he said, as a matter of fact, this summer, we're gonna get together. He said, I wanna get together. And, and I call her my warrior because of how she survived cancer. So that, that's the kind of moment that makes me very proud. I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds. I mean, from sitting in the stands, watching him knock people over and getting his name called every other second, uh, to being number seven in Central Texas for the work that he was doing, uh, and then, you know, everything else, whether it be in school, and we never had any issues in school, except, of course, the same thing that was said when he was young, and that is, he's, he, he's, he's vocal, uh, he's very smart, uh, and, and he can take over, not just 
in 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 those areas but in any area that he puts his mind to and it's because he's he brings that kind of brilliance i'm not going to sit here and act as if tony didn't have his own hardships and, and struggles and stuff as well like there were times where i wasn't there to personally help and or you know go through them with him but i do know for example when after we graduated, you went through a little rough patch trying to find yourself and what you wanted to do. Because, oh, yeah. you know, there were so many expectations. Oh, Tony's gonna go to the NFL or the NBA. or He could do, he could take both if he wanted to. Like everybody was just putting you on this pedestal. And when you get put on that pedestal, that can, that can do something Good to you, crap. especially at that age, because you have the whole world in front of you. And it's like, man, do I do what makes everybody proud or do I do what I want to do? But wait, what do I want to do? Mm. How proud I am of you, um, I think that goes without saying, man. I, I, don't, I don't even really know how to put that in perspective. I'm, I'm beyond proud of you. I'm pretty sure if I went to the right place and within the right crowds, people go, oh man, you know Tony Tavares? Like, that's the kind of effect you have. So to say where I think Tony will be, I think Tony will be somewhere where he's looking down at the stars, waiting on the rest of them to rise. Well, there's a lot of definitions of what bodybuilding is because it's so many things to so many people. There's too many different meanings. So really, if you ask 100 people what it means to them, you could potentially get 100 different answers. Because there's no cookie cutter here. <laughs> it's an art. Bodybuilding in my eyes is a reflection of how we live our lives. And all of us are bodybuilding. Some of us, it just doesn't look good. Brace everything to the surface. There you go. Oh my God. Okay, so I can look at it as, as, as trying to create a Picasso, a Van Gogh. Some people, it's just, you know, blood and guts. It's Dorian Yates' motto. It's blood and guts, like he would die for it. And if you watch his training style, you can see the very few people can train the way he did, which is why there's very few people that were able to rival him. Ronnie Coleman. I think when you do a survey over what the great bodybuilders all have in common. I think we all know as individuals that there's nobody that's gonna do it for us. I never even thought I was gonna get into bodybuilding and into the sport. So we did grow up with my dad would be like, okay, we're going to go out for a jog. And I hated it, a four mile jog. I'm totally not into that. <laughs> I'm about the only one in the family who's quite different. I'm more laid back, you know. I hated that. Tony didn't like it either in the beginning, but actually he learned something from it. As you see, he, he also loves using and pushing his physical body. I fell in love with the sport. It filled a void of competition. You know, what I loved about bodybuilding, you know, because when I think about it from the surface, it's very egotistical, I guess. You know, there's a bunch of people, they just want to do it just for the physical, just to look good. Just maybe, maybe they had little man syndrome <laughs> when they were young, or maybe it was just about girls. Like they get into it many for the wrong reasons. And sometimes they go down a dark path in the sport. There's been many people in the sport that have died. Um, so there's a, there, there's some people that are like, it's a negative sport, it's not that good. But for others, it is a positive sport. It is a way to release some of that anxiety, get into the gym, have fun with the people you care about, and truly 
get better and progress. And what I love about the sport, this is the deep part I love, that you could work for six months straight, eating strategically, week in, week out, having a plan, trying to shape a muscle this way, shape a muscle that way, grow a muscle this way, and go at it for six months straight, all to get on a stage for five minutes. You don't have a shield of armor. There's nowhere to hide. You have a tiny piece of cloth that separates you from the audience. And everything else is gonna be, what did you do this off season? What did you do with your summer? What have you been doing in your contest prep? And, and the only answer you have for it is to make sure that you're prepared. Sometimes I'm selfish, get jealous. I feel a little helpless. My whole world has shifted again. You made a promise, I kept it. Now I'm second guessing. My whole world has shifted again. Now I drive back to an empty home, and it's sad. I think what I loved about it is you can't hide the results. So going back to what my dad did with the results, you get rewarded for what you put in. And I love the fact that you can't hide. You're out there in basically underwear. <laughs> the whole crowd, thousands of people are seeing what real work did you put in? You can't fool people. It's either you ate right, you lifted your ass off, you did your cardio, you stayed disciplined, or you didn't. And they could see it. So I love that concept. And I think if you can take that positive, deciphered message from bodybuilding and put that into business or anything you do, you can be absolutely phenomenal at it. Um, so it was a void that then was filled to get my competition juices flowing once again. We're at a point in bodybuilding where five years ago I made the comment, it's on record, that classic physique would be something that we're talking about more than bodybuilding. So when I see these young guys come along and they're doing the business of bodybuilding, my trained eye has gone towards the classic physique division because these guys are paying attention to detail. Some people show true presence on stage. They, they aren't in their mind. They're looking out their eyes. They're, they're not managing themselves with stiffness and rigidity. They're fluid and, and, and they're they're liquid and in a way that's not passive but alive and I love it when they reference the old school bodybuilders and my name is amongst them because it tells me that the work I did in the 80s and the 90s and the turn of 2000 left an impression on them the same way that the work that Frank Zane did Mohammed McAway uh, Samir Banu. These guys were impressionable athletes before I ever hit the scene in bodybuilding that I actually had the opportunity to come to know in late, the later years, but I always paid homage to those physiques. And so to hear the new guys talk about myself or some of the other OGs, uh, it, it tells us that what we did mattered and it counted. And now it's more relevant today than it ever was because bodybuilding is no longer what it once was. And uh, it seems like a very participatory sport. Anybody can get big, so anybody can compete. But back then, we were elite. 
I can appreciate the classic physique guys. Not only that, but they look back to the OGs in order to see where they're going to go. And that division is still on the rise. Athletes like Tony and Terrence Ruffin and Chris Bumstead and Brian Ansley, they respect and pay homage to the guys that laid the foundation for where they're at because we paved the way for them. There was a, a, a top veteran of the sport who runs a bunch of shows in the, in the fitness world that came up to me backstage, actually, when, when I was backstage at my first show. And I just got off the stage and he comes back and he runs back there and I didn't really know who he was. He's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm Ed Pariso. I, I, I run all of Texas bodybuilding shows. And he comes back there and this is my first show. So I have no clue who this is. He's like, I'm the president of the NPC. And he's like, man, I see greatness in you. Like, I see you could be a star. What you did out there for your first time was incredible. And he said, you stick with this, you're gonna go far in the sport. So it's like, if he didn't say that to me, would it have clicked? I don't know. The lowest point, and there's probably only three or four people on earth that know this but the lowest point in my life was a night I was doing drugs with a bunch of people and we were out partying. And I remember um, feeling like um, I was paranoid and I was being chased by the law, by the FBI, because I was so in my head and I was so out of touch with reality that I thought they were after me. And I remember um, taking a bunch of drugs that night and just about overdosing because I was in fear that I was going to be going to prison or something. Like, like I, was, I was young. I didn't understand. Um, that wasn't my world that I really dabbed in. I just got around some of the wrong people. And I was, I, I, I was, I remember that night, it must have been three in the morning, my lowest, lowest point of my life. I was uh, laying there and I thought the, the law enforcement was coming in on me and I thought my life was over. I thought I let my parents down. And I remember thinking, how am I gonna tell my mom? that I ruined it all, that I destroyed my whole life. And uh, I remember looking up in the ceiling and asking God to give me one more chance. And if he got me out of it, I would change my world. And that's what I did. Since he was born, or even before he was born, it was, this, this expectation that this little one was going to be so freaking awesome. And he was born, you know, his first childhood years as he was still young. He was like, this little kid, he is so dynamic. You already could tell, you know, by the age of two. He was just, he got things, he understood things, and he was like, okay, I got it, go and I'm going to do it awesomely. It was right here, about 15 years ago. These are my fondest memories right here. Right. What do you remember about Tony Traveris? What do you think when, when you hear that name? When I hear Tony? Mm -hmm. uh, Tony, Tony was always a class act, okay? Uh, I remember when he was young, the way he used to work. Uh, you know, some people, some people uh, go the horse races, and before you go the horse races, right before that race is ran, they bring the horses out and they walk them around the track so that you can get a better look at them and uh, know how to bet. Well, I don't know that much about horse flesh, but I know athletes. And Tony was my bet. That's who I was putting my money on. 
Michael Jordan, his biggest thing was he was in the moment all the time. He was present all the time. You know, I think Kobe too was like kind of like that. And um, that's Tony is so present all the time, and that's hard to do. I, I think that that's a thing that people have trouble with. That's something I have trouble with, right? But just in the moment, right there, all the time. Don't matter what it is, hanging out with his friends in the moment. Like, yeah, that's who he's hanging out. That's who he's focusing on. That's his focus. Working, that's his focus. Working out, that's his focus at that moment. That's so hard to do. It's never about, you know, you're hanging out with Tony and, and it's not like, all right, what am I, he, you know, looking at his phone like, oh, what am I gonna go do next? What am I gonna do? That's not him. We're in this right now. That's what we're gonna do. It doesn't matter what it is. We had questions about Tony in the beginning because we, it was a chore to get him to read. Let's say like throughout your life, right? You have 10 chapters, right? What chapter are you in right now of your life? Hmm. I think I'm in chapter five. Who knew I would make it this far? They hated, they never believe me. Yeah, I would never drop the ball. I know I make it look easy. Yeah, Mayweather with the defense. I don't care what a critic got to say. I got him picked another piece. Chapter five. Why five? Uh, because there's so much more to the story to come. In my mind, there's so much more that I can accomplish. There's so much more uh, that I can give to the world based on my awareness now. Um, my, my shift in my 30s of understanding more just in life and what we're here to do and how powerful I truly am in the mind that I can create anything I want. So seeing everything, my life in the past 34 years, that's to me half of what I'm about to be able to accomplish, so to speak. And I don't mean accomplish necessarily, but I think there's so many more experiences to go gain. And I think these next chapters, I'm gonna be so much more at peace, which I can't wait to experience those. <laughs> I foresee whatever he does, I foresee him putting in 100% and doing really well. Axillary, but I also see him raising a family. to me, it shows me that there's a level of love that I never ever knew. I think about it, I think about it as a kid. You love your grandparents, you love your parents, you have this type of love for your parents. You have love for siblings. Then you get older, you might have love for a spouse or a partner. But I tell you what, fatherhood there's no there's no love that even compares here is my monkey short and stout i'll bring the tea you bring the spout <laughs> the look of your own child looking up at you and knowing that they 
look to you for everything and that they know that you're dad and you're their provider. You're, you're, you, 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 you would do anything for them. Um, and to truly execute that and give them that life. Like I think about it now with our daughter and me and my girl will have conversations about it like she truly feels loved. Like she's so happy. She's so, everyone around her is like she's smiling all the time. She's running up to all these other kids. She's so open and it feels so good as a father to be able to provide anything that she wants, any option, any anywhere we want to take her, anything we want to, any opportunities we want to give her to get her ahead of life, we can. And to truly feel as a father that you know that she feels immense love every day. Like there's, there's many kids out there that don't have great parents or don't have people that they, they feel loved by. He came from a different upbringing than Kurt and I did. He had a great family, a great mom and dad um, who are still together, who had a sex, successful business. They, you know, um, he played, uh, he was a, a high school um, star, football star where he came from. But I think with him, what drives him, that he may not even know it, is that he knows he was afforded some opportunities that some people don't have. And he's like, forget that shit. I'm not taking that for granted. I'm going to take it freaking 10x to the next level. I don't want anybody saying Tony got where he was because of his parents and even Kurt. Tony got where he is because Tony's driven and Tony busts his ass and Tony's always want to be better. Something gets you out of bed. What is that? I would say, uh, you know, besides the fact of, you know, you know that name that I'm carrying, and um, I would say, you know, the question is, why, why am I here? There's a clear difference from those at the top. We have different animal. We have different animal right now. <laughs> the ones at the bottom just don't want to admit it. Ash. Ash. I have too many. Ash. It's like when you really, I've been doing a lot of soul searching lately and just trying to dive internally on who I really am. What do I really want? Why am I really here? And it's to impact as many people as I can while I'm on this earth. Like we only have, it's like 28,000 some odd uh, days on average that you live like yep. the average life it's like I've already probably I'm almost at the halfway mark I don't have much time you know and while I'm here I want to impact and, and change as many lives as possible around me for the better I foresee him taking it to the next level and that there's no ceiling there's no ceiling really it's you know it's up to him so um I don't foresee anything specific. I just foresee a ne the next level and that it's unlimited, unlimited potential. So for people that don't know you, ex explain to, you know, look in the camera and tell them who Tony Tavares is. Yeah, so, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, you see my Instagram, you'll see it says Tony Goat Tavares and people are probably like, you know, what, what's this dude talking about? <laughs> How is he the goat, right? <laughs> you know, he's just starting in this industry. But I, I would take it back to, you know, I grew up in a town called Grosbeck, um, a small town, country town out in Texas, and our mascot was a goat. You know, <laughs> funny story, I was 13 years old and, you know, we just moved to this town called Grosbeck. And, I go to my dad, I'm like, Dad, you know, we just moved from a bulldog. You know, why do we have to move to Grosbeck? Their mascot is a goat. A goat is not cool, Dad, <laughs> right? He's like, he's like, son, what are you talking about? Goat, that means greatest of all time. Tony is really good about making someone feel truly amazing. Like, he comes in, he's got that big smile. He's like ready to like, you know, conquer the day. I've watched you blossom 
each and every day for years now. And I have yet to see you slow down. And by slow down, I'm not saying as if you don't have time for your family or anything like that, because there are people th that, you know, it's just work, 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 and nobody else sees me. I don't sleep, I don't do anything else. It's just work, work, work. But from what I see and what I know, man, I not only could not be any more proud of you, but I honestly feel like there are a lot of young men out here, especially like, I'll put it to you like this. If I could right now put the 10 year old me in front of a man that I feel like would be a great father figure and just force to put him in the position that I wish he could have been put in, he'd be with you. So what's one thing that he has not changed since he was young? He's the same. I, it, it doesn't he just has it, more knowledge. But. Yeah, he's he's grown in like knowledge and everything, but but as far as like the drive and the, you know, always, always striving to do better, and all, that's always been there. Tony has never been satisfied with just you know status quo. There was never a doubt he'd be successful at something. No matter what has happened in his life, he has always tried to look at the bright side and encourage others, those who are around him, to also look at the bright side. Like, hey, what are you frowning for? It's going to be all right. Come on, we got this. You know, and that, just the way that he is, when he walks into a room, it's infectious. One of the most positively infectious things we could describe, you know, on Earth at the present moment. And that's, that's him. You know, you'll hear that from a lot of people. And I am biased, because I'm his big sister. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's honesty. Any of you guys heard the story of the farmer, the Zen farmer? There was once a farmer, he had a horse. And then that, that horse was his favorite horse. The horse breaks out of the village. And the villagers come running, and the farmer's like, they're asking him, like, are you sad? Are you upset? Or He's like, it's not positive. It's maybe. Horse comes back, brings three wild horses. And the villagers are raving. They're like, oh, aren't you happy? And he's like, maybe. The next day, his son jumps on a wild horse, takes off, son falls off, breaks his leg. Villagers like, oh, are you not upset? And he's like, maybe. The next day, the army comes and is grabbing all the boys to send them off to war. And they pass on the sun. And the farmer thinks to himself, maybe. Because anything that happens in your world, if you deem it negative, it's not negative. It might be what you need to actually transform to the next version of yourself to handle whatever the fuck you need. It's only fucking positive. That's it. Anything that happens to you from this day moving forward is only growth. It's only going to transform. It's only going to alchemize your life. Go and create your dream. Thank you, guys.